So for the last bit of class, we're just not going to have time to look at the third movement. That's okay. It's not the material. Um, we have a presentation by Nain Degan, who is a student in my uh, upper division Mozart class. Um, he's doing his final project on this movement, and I've asked him to come talk to us about it. Um, and before he does, let's see if we can. <coughs> The last thing I want to say before Nain talks is a, um, a practical thing. On your syllabus, you have an, another piano concerto for this week that we were going to talk about and listen to. That is no longer on our plan. It's not part of the syllabus. They're not responsible for knowing it. So, um, and with that, please give a hand to your fellow student Nain, who is going to tell us about the piano. Good start. So uh, the first thing I wanted to say about this movement is that in the 41st Symphony, the last movement is the longest movement and it is the most significant movement. And that is um, somewhat a departure from what had been usually done up to that point. Usually what, what composers would do is have the most significant movement at the beginning, the one that's in auto form. But um, here we see that uh, the last movement is the one with the most wealth of thematic um, harmonic and stylistic elements. And the term sublime, if you guys remember that from earlier on in the class, is often used to describe this movement. And that really comes from uh, the seamless way that Mozart combines elements of opera buffa and elements of fugal writing, which I'll explain in a minute what they are. Um, but in this last movement, we have, well, I mean, that wealth of thematic material, we got the most number of melodies in this movement, the, the harmony, the chords that are used, and the, uh, the progressions, the, the order in which they're used, are the most adventurous in this movement. So uh, does anybody know what fugal writing is, or what a fugue is? Has anybody heard of that before? OK, uh, so in, in simple terms, fugal writing, well, it's, first of all, it's a style of writing that comes out of the late Baroque era. And the, the Baroque, we've been studying the classical era, Mozart being in the classical with the capital C era. Before that, we had the Baroque, and before the Baroque, we had the Renaissance, then the medieval. And the Baroque era is somewhere between the 1600s till 1750, the death of Bach. And what's important about the Baroque is that they were really obsessed with highly ornamented um, writing with really uh, dense counterpoint. Counterpoint is basically having multiple melodies pitted against each other simultaneously. And nobody did this better than the late Baroque German composers like Bach and Handel. So um, if you works kind of like a canon, um, in that you have, one, you have one melodic line and multiple voices sing it, they, they come in at different times, but at, at uh, certain intervals, they come in and they all sing the same melody. So if you work somewhat in the same way, we have one, initial melody, they call it the subject, which is performed by one voice or an instrument or whatever. And then once that, uh, that, that voice is finished playing that melody, it is picked up by another voice, and the first voice goes on to a new melody. So I want to show you just a snippet of a, uh, of a Bach uh, few, just, just so you guys get an idea of what that sounds like. Another voice, and then when we go on 
um, the third voice picks it up. And Bach sometimes would write fugues that had uh, six voices playing in them. But the thing about a fugue, even when one with six voices, is that you don't actually have six distinct melodies being performed simultaneously. You have maybe one or two, maybe three tunes at once. What happens is either some of the voices sit out, or if they're all playing at once, um, they are doubling up apart. So multiple voices are playing the same line. Now, what, uh, what makes Mozart's uh, 41st Symphony's last movement so significant is that from the get-go we have some argue four, some argue five distinct melodies in the movement. And, uh, and these melodies are later incorporated in a fugal, in a fugato of passages, fugal writing passages, which are the most difficult, most complex types of composition. And uh, again, Bach was considered the master of this type of composition, but in the last movement of the Jupiter, Mozart, Mozart kind of um, does one up over Bach, and uh, he had the four or some argue five melodies all played simultaneously. And so when people refer to the to the um, last movement of the Mozart 41st as sublime, it really comes down to the fact that he had this really dense counterpoint at the end of it, and uh, the way he treats these uh, thematic elements. So I'm gonna play you guys the five melodies before I actually play the movement. And what we're gonna see throughout the movement is that he is gonna bring these melodies back um, as they were in the beginning, he's gonna bring them back in the minor mode. Um, we're gonna see them come back inverted. So if the, like let's take one melody, if it starts here, goes up, then up, then down. What we're gonna see is it's gonna start here, go down, down, then up. So it's a mirror image of, of what it originally was. And we're gonna hear it actually played backwards sometimes. So these are all thematic developments that Mozart does with these elements that really come from fugal writing of the late Baroque, which was a German uh, it, really, it was really championed by the late German composers. And in a way, he's paying homage to Bach and Handel in that. Now, another element of, uh, of this last movement is uh, opera buffa. If you guys recall from, uh, from last week, us talking about uh, ensemble finales at the end of an opera act, what we have is all the different characters come back on stage, they sing their line, their, their number, and they're all singing simultaneously. It kind of gets really exciting at the end before it all and, and uh, in the, what was it, the piece we were looking at was, uh, was Marriage of Figaro, the, the ensemble finale at the end of Act Two, and that's about 22 minutes long. Now what we have in this movement is, uh, the form is sonata form, pretty basic sonata form. It starts, it doesn't have a slow introduction. We have the exposition, which gets repeated. We have the development and recap that also get repeated, but then we have an extended coda and in that coda, there are 27 seconds where all these themes that I'm going to play for you right now come back simultaneously, just like in, um, in an ensemble finale. And this piece was written just a year after the three um, major uh, Mozart operas were uh, premiered. So it's, it's fair to think that he, was, he still had some residual operatic composition in his mind when he was writing this piece. So here's the first theme. Okay, that's it, it's that short. significant, but to have all these melodies work together in a fugal passage is really difficult. Another thing about this movement is that in a sonata form movement, we tend to think that there's going to be a first theme and a second theme, and there are melodic ideas that are associated with the first theme, and melodic ideas that are associated with the second theme, and in the development section, we do see them interact, but not in the actual themes themselves. But what we have here is a little bit different. What Mozart does is that he takes these four um, the melodies that I played for you, and he treats them like characters. So they come in uh, in places where we don't expect them. So we have the first two themes come in the first uh, first home key area. If you think of it as the first 
here would be like my house, and the second one would be my cousin's house. We meet a couple of people at my house, we expect to meet a couple of other people at my cousin's and nothing else. But we get the first two people in my house, we meet one more character on the way to my cousin's house in the transition, and when we get to my cousin's house, we have actually, um, we have a couple of the old characters come back. So he's playing with the expectations of, 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 the, of his listeners. And this whole idea of reserving the most significant movement for the very end starts with this piece, but we can trace it all the way down to Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. I'm sure most of you have heard the, uh, the Ode to Joy uh, chorus at the end of the Ninth Movement. In Beethoven's Ninth uh, Symphony, the last movement is the most important movement. And this idea of saving the best for last really starts here with Mozart. And one more thing about sonata form before I play the piece is that uh, I don't know how many of you watch South Park <laughs> or have seen one episode of South Park. Every South Park episode is in, is in sonata form. And I've, I've listened to the, the writers actually talk about this. They have an exposition in the beginning to meet the kids at the bus stop and they, they talk about like a conflict like Al Gore and Mamre Pig and then they go off <laughs> on like an adventure, something, a conflict happens and at the end of it, you know, Kenny dies and then Stan learns a lesson. <laughs> but I just want you to understand that, that sonata form lends itself really well to storytelling. And so when we see that he's using sonata form and he's got all these distinct thematic ideas and the ensemble finale, it's fair to think that he was really thinking opera lupa or he was trying to incorporate as much of that in this um, instrumental work as he could. Okay, so. Before I play the full movement, I'd like to play that bit of fugal writing at the end, the 27 seconds that I talked about, because you may not remember by the time we get there. Thank <laughs> you. 